And I'm really very glad that uh, Linda Kelly, um, head, of, uh, the head of learning of the Aust Australian Maritime Museum, uh, was able to join us today. I got to know her in Taiwan many, many years ago. And since then I worked to get her into one of our conferences and this time it worked with Berlin. Very nice, thanks very much, Linda, for a long, long travel. Linda is, um, I'm, I'm sure she, not only is she interested in museums and in uh, museum experiences, uh, she is, um, I think, one of the most de uh, digital person I know. She's always online somewhere. Um, and I don't know if you, if, yeah, if you send her an email, you will get a response saying, uh, I'm currently in Berlin, but you can watch me or follow me on, yeah? So, and um, anyway, she also has a Twitter account, and I just wanted to uh, introduce you her tw Twitter account because I find that's quite interesting. She's a museum worker, a researcher, a webby typey, social media tragic, tragic, mother, cook, chief bottle washer, we talked about that last night, what that is exactly, likes good food, great wine and bluesy music. Um, and Linda, maybe you might, might know as well, she was or is, because that has been uh, discontinued, the director of Museum 3, which was a social online, a social media uh, website where, um, for the future of museums in a way, and it had 3,000 members, can you imagine? Um, it was disbanded, or oh, it just kind of just yeah, floated on. around, so Maybe it's not, it, you can still find uh, discussions and debates on, on there, which is interesting. But Linda, uh, I'm sure in her paper she will Twitter about the epic fall or fail of audience research in, digital, in the digital age. Linda, hey, welcome. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Excellent. Thanks. So, um, just to start... I actually worked for 27 years at the Australian Museum until July last year when I decided to move on to something else and it was very interesting for me to reflect back on where I've come from as an audience researcher at that institution. For 20 years I was doing audience research there. Um, and, then <clears throat> and what I also did when I was at the Australian Museum was move more into the digital side and again for me as an audience researcher and with a very much an audience focused hat on, um, doing digital products and mobile products was very uh, a really good grounding for me because we always start with the audience and the audience is at the centre of everything that, that you do when you're certainly when you're doing digital work. And what I'm going to talk about in the paper is the kind of lessons that I've learnt from being a digital person, which a lot of people in our profession think I am. They don't kind of remember that I did audience research. But what I want to do is reflect on how some of that work can inform how audience research can probably rebrand itself, I think, is the best way that I can put it because what I'm seeing in the audience research world is that it's kind of slipping by and it's not becoming as central to museum practice as it used to be. Maybe that's just me thinking that but that's where I'm coming from. Um, I can just tell you a chief bottle washer means that you're the person that does everything, especially if you're a mother. Like I always say, if you want something done, ask a mother or ask a single mother, he'll get it done very quickly. Um, then I'm, in October last year I moved to the Maritime Museum and this is it here. Now that photo, have you got one of these things? The photo over there, that's the view from my office. So can you imagine going from a dusty old museum where I was in a demountable room mostly, which is a temporary office, to being on Sydney Harbour and every day just looking out and seeing this amazing vessels and ships and people out in the sun enjoying themselves. So it's um, really fantastic. And so you can see up on the top right, um, whatever that is, left-hand side, um, that's the Endeavour. So the Maritime Museum has the best, or well, the only replica of the Endeavour, which is the, the ship that came out to Australia and kind of discovered Australia before or European discovery. Um, and that's, uh, again, an amazing kind of vessel that we have that visitors love to come and see at the Maritime Museum. And that down there is the Sydney... Um, when we had a lot of fires and things and you could just get that, that totally beautiful view. And the Maritime Museum is interesting because it's a fairly young museum. It was only established or built in 1991. It's got a collection of about 40,000 objects, whereas the museum I'd come from had been established in 1827. It was a very old, venerable institution with millions and millions and millions of specimens. So it's, um, it was a big change for me. And also going to the Maritime Museum, which is predominantly an outdoor space as well as an indoor space, and seeing how visitors actually negotiate that and, and 
and visit, it's it was also very eye-opening for me. So that's that. And just up in the right-hand corner, that's um, something that I'll come back to at the end of my talk. That's a Lego, one of our visitors who made a Lego piece out of, um, a piece out of Lego based on one of our historic vessels. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that at the end. So um, I just wanted to kind of have a bit of a re-look at where audience research has come from. And one of my heroes, Benjamin Gilman, who I know somebody here, I think was Jan Saas in the Netherlands. He's done a lot of research into this man who was at the Boston Fine Arts Institute. And he did a lot of work back in 1916 actually photographing really uncomfortable positions that visitors were in and like text panels would be up here or objects would be down there and it was quite interesting when I did my PhD I was taking similar photos of visitors on the ground pretty much trying to look at things or um, text panels that you can't read and all of that kind of stuff and it got me thinking with the title of my talk is that we've done all this audience research since well, the early, the late 19, 1800s, and I'm just wondering why we still provide experiences for visitors that just really don't cut it. So, yeah, again, this long history of audience research across museums, and I always find it um, amusing when I go to London. I've, I've been there a few times, and people come and say, come and talk to us about audience research, and I th think, well, back in the... 1930s and 1970s and early on you were doing all this work and what's happened to it there was some great work done by Griggs and Melton and those people that really based in social science and really very rigorous about how people were using museums and I'm kind of laughing now because what what we can do is through technologies actually track people and I remember as a young young maybe mostly young audience researcher when we had to do tracking studies and you'd be following these people around and for two hours and I remember once we did one and I think someone was in the exhibition for two hours, but he'd fallen asleep in front of the video. So it was like, you know, <laughs> to sit there and wait for that to finish. Whereas now we can just track them through their phones or through chips and things like that, which we'll hear about a bit later. But um, it's kind of interesting how we have got this long history. We've got many different kinds of focuses that we've had in audience research. We have moved into the digital world and we're starting to look at things like organisational change. Um, and again, kind of, where has all that work gone? Just to talk about the context of museums, and what, what we're seeing now in the museum is we're not, not just a physical entity, so museums operate in three environments, so we're looking at, um, of course, the physical space, and again, for me, this beautiful um, building and site that I'm located in, but we also have our online world, so we have our websites, our social media, and then we also increasingly have mobile, so lots of museums are now providing mobile experiences, mobile apps, whatever, um, for their audiences, and interestingly, this one, Lucy, she's our kind of museum mascot, and she, th this application was developed in term, in, along with a Vikings exhibition that we had at the museum, but most of the downloads weren't from people that were at that exhibition, and I think we had that discussion this morning, and I know at the Australian Museum, they've got a Tyrannosaur show at the moment, and the app that I was working on before I left... Um, that's had hundreds of thousands of downloads, mostly from the UK and the US. So it's interesting that we provide these mobile experiences and we think that they're grounded in our physical site, but they're often not. So that's um, something that we need to think about. So this, for me, is the context that we're all working in now. And as audience researchers, it's like, well, how are we going to actually look at the experience across all of these different sites? <coughs> We also have challenges of what has been called Generation C, which is a connected audience. So it's not, not just our visitors, but it's also our staff and our stakeholders. We're all working across these different um, spaces. So we've got people who are in control of their own experiences. They're, they're choosing what they pay attention to. They seek challenges. They work and learn collaboratively. And they're widely connected. And if you kind of start looking at and unpacking some of this, it's pretty much like what constructivist learning looks like. It's all about challenge and control and choice. Um, we also talk about the next generation. The next generation is the post-Google generation. They're not Googly anymore. They're doing lots of other things. Children that won't know a world that they haven't been connected to some kind of electronic device. And there's a really lovely blog post um, uh, by a technical guy who just had a baby and then he thought, OK, well, what kinds of technologies won't this person have ever known? And it was things like fax machines, a mouse probably, a hard drive. Um, it's, I'll post it on my blog later because it's just fun to read when you're of a certain age thinking that they'll, they'll never have a clue of what, what it is you're talking about when you talk about a mouse. 
and I think there's something about somebody was asking someone about going and looking for a mouse and they freaked out thinking that they actually had to go and find a physical mouse. So anyway. Also worth thinking, um, this was one thing that I heard back in 2008 from Ralph Applebaum, that famous architect, I think, museum architect. And what he said really resonated with me at the time was that a visitor will come to the, your museum with more technology in their pocket than you could ever provide throughout the, the whole museum. Um, so that really got me thinking about, well, okay, how are we going to engage our audiences in a physical sense with technology when they're coming with better technology that they really want to use themselves? So again, that's kind of started to, um, started to get, getting me to think about what the physical experience is and do we actually provide any technology? If I had my way, I'd, I'd have nothing. Um, this whole idea about how people deal with app applications and kids today, and a lot of adults too, I've done a lot of work talking to visitors about smartphone usage, what, what tech they use, what apps they've got, and it's interesting to me, the hardest question that I ever ask somebody is, if you could only have one application on your phone, what would it be? And people are like, oh no, I have to have this, this is... <laughs> anyway, they mostly say Facebook, which is a bit boring, but um, that's the way it is. And then there's some interesting research done by Google who was looking at um, how mobile devices, and they, they looked a lot at mobile devices and shopping. And shopping is a very interesting example because people will be in a shop, and I know my daughter does this, she's in the shop and she's online already looking for different prices and she's like, well, I can get this for that. So it's all about, it's, it's not meaning that she's, she's a huge online shopper. There's little packages are coming every second day to our house. Um, but that doesn't mean that she's not, she doesn't go and physically shop. She loves physically shopping. It's just that the nature of the relationship between her as a consumer and the shopkeeper is like, I'm actually in charge now because you can't charge me that price because I know I can get it online. So I think um, this idea of what people are doing online is um, very interesting. Um, so as I said, I've done, I've done research on people's use of tech since 2007 when I was at the Australian Museum and one of the biggest things that I've been finding over the years is that people that visit museums and galleries, that physically visit them, really put a higher participation in online activities. So one of the early studies I did, we asked people about whether they commented on blogs, whether they did participated in social media and that kind of thing. And we also asked them if they were a museum visitor or not. And doing some stats and that kind of thing, we found that people that were tended to go to museums and galleries tended to do more participation online. So it was really... Um, interesting at that time thinking, okay, well, if people are already participating online and they're coming to our museums, what does that do about the visitor experience? It's like the shopping experience I was saying, they're now in, more in charge and they're now more in control of what they do. Um, studies that I conducted at the Australian Museum from 2008 to 2012, we found that mobile device usage and um, and ownership was always high amongst our visitors. And we also found that museum visitors tended to rate themselves more highly as early adopters. That might be an Australian thing, I'm not sure, but um, certainly they would say, yes, I'm, I do adopt things. Um, a good example is a site called Pinterest. Has anybody heard of that? It's like an online online boards where you pin things to a board and you just, you, you collect images. It's like curating your own gallery, really. Um, and that was a very new site a few years ago. And I found that when I surveyed um, museum visitors, they were all on it. So it was like, again, it was kind of something about that whole nature of people that visit museums. And maybe, again, it's the Australianness of it or it's their education level, but they do tend to be more highly engaged with tech. And this is just some different um, data that I was collecting over January. Um, and tablets are very interesting to me because the artist David Hockney, I went to one of his exhibitions when I happened to be in Toronto, and he did. He used to do these huge canvases of artworks. Now he does it all on iPads. So his, all his um, exhibitions are now done on iPads, and he talked about the iPad as being a very disruptive technology and changing the way that people think and the way that people learn, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, just some tech trends then. So these are, these are some of the trends that I've been looking at and following probably over the last two years. Um, gaming, to me, is a very interesting kind of thing. And if you want to know um, what museum's looking at gaming, you just go to the Dallas Museum of Art and there's a um, Rob Stein, S-T-E-I-N. Again, I'll post up some links to his work. They're just using gaming as the way that they deal with their members. So it's not about you pay your membership 
and you come back to the museum and go to lectures or whatever. It's all about the more badges that you collect as a member, the more times you come, the more activities you do. And it's, it's all about that kind of leaderboard idea and getting more and more engaged and a closer relationship with their members. So it's a very interesting idea. Also, um, gaming, there was some research done in the UK about gamers actually gaining a whole lot of skills, life skills, project management, they had to learn to work in teams, they had to make decisions, all that kind of stuff. And just something that John said this morning resonated with me about tech is maybe not a social thing. To me, gaming is totally social. My son used to play Call of Duty or some of those awful shoot-up games in the garage and I could hear what he was doing but he was spending his time on this game but he also had one of these microphone things and he was chatting and he was there was a Facebook application that came with this and so he was doing all this stuff so he was inherently social so to me gaming is a very social thing and what we can learn from gaming about how we provide um, experiences in our physical side is really interesting. Um, Multi-screening is something I've been thinking about a lot because we multitask at the moment. So you're listening to me, writing notes, maybe sending a text or doing whatever it is you're doing. But we're also multi-screening, which means that we might be watching TV, but we're also on our tablet and we're also on our phone and we're doing lots of different things at the same time. Um, <clears throat> again, Google did some really interesting research about the four screens that we have in our lives and how they all uh, relate to each other. And television, again, is a very interesting one because TV, certainly in Australia, and I think mostly throughout the world, has managed to reinvent itself and become a very social medium. So you're not just sitting there watching the TV. You're on the Facebook page or you're voting on Twitter or you're doing whatever it is you're doing. Um, and that all happens because of technology and because of tablets, mostly. Um, tablet, I've got phablets up there, which is the next awful <laughs> term that we're going to hear, which is the, the tablet that is your phone, which, again, some of the research that I've been reading is really going to overtake any kind of smartphone ownership probably within the next couple of years. Um, tablets are now, there's more people own a tablet or are buying tablets, certainly in Australia, than they are a smartphone. Um, MOOCs, has anybody heard of MOOCs or done a MOOC? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, John, you had, did you finish it? Who finished their MOOC? No one. <laughs> MOOCs are called Massive Open Online Courses. And what they're doing is they're kind of democratising education, which means that thousands and hundreds of thousands of people sign up to these courses. Most of them don't finish, but it's all about I can actually go and do a course at Harvard or at Berkeley University with some major person and I can just get all of that information and just do it in my own time and in my own place. Um, and what... What this has done to the university sector is like museums. The universities are a lot like museums. They're quite conservative. They have their own ways of doing stuff. Um, it's really challenging universities to think about, well, OK, who am I providing this education for and how can I do it in a way that's um, open to everybody? But also what MOOCs have done is actually opened up how you can use technology and a lot of it's video based and social media based and it's how it changes the way that people actually learn and do, um, do courses there. And BYOD, do you know what that means? Some people, yes, no. Um, bring your own device. So we have a lot of fights in the museum about, well, should we be providing devices or should we bring them ourselves? And there's a lot of fighting in the educational literature about, well, should school students be allowed to bring their own device to school? Well, they're doing it, so you may as well do the go with it. Um, our data shows that, um, and I think there was a study done at the VNA which talked to people about device usage and people were going, well, I want to use my own device because I know how to use it and it's clean. That was a big thing. Like hygiene was quite a big issue. So again, when we're thinking about providing experiences, it's kind of what technology are we providing and are we better off just giving people something that they can download to their own phone um, before they come. And image sharing, to me, this is probably the biggest social use of technology. I mean, how many times do we go to a museum where we take a photo of ourselves and we might Instagram it or tweet it out or put it on our Facebook page or even email it to somebody? Um, to me, that's, as an audience researcher, looking at feeds of Instagram and feeds of what people are actually posting their Facebook page is a very fascinating way and maybe that's something that we can think about in terms of making audience research a bit more relevant, which I'll come back to later. Um, and as you can see here, people are sharing 500 million photos every day. So I just find that kind of thing mind-blowing. And what we did during the summer at the Maritime Museum is just had this simple photo opportunity where people, we had a Vikings exhibition and people could just 
put their head in a Viking thing and take photos and we asked them to send it and have a hashtag feed through Instagram. And again, just looking at what people were doing and how they were sharing that was a really great thing for us. Um, let's talk about Twitter. This is the first conference I've been to where I haven't sent a tweet. Has anybody? <laughs> no. um, I'm a huge Twitter user. Well, an intermittent Twitter user. I use it when I want to use it. So if I'm at a conference, I'm using it a lot. If I'm reading something or researching something, I'm using it a lot. Um, but also, I've been thinking about Twitter as an re audience research tool. We used to have a program when I was at the Australian Museum called Jurassic Lounge. It was for young adults and they'd come to the museum after work and have a few drinks and wander around the exhibitions and talk to the scientists. It was really fantastic. It was our most popular program, their most popular program. And I did an analysis of the tweets and just looking at the kinds of things that they were saying. In 140 characters, the second... Yeah, the second last tweet from this Hello Carmel, what she was saying is she left the museum, she went across the park, she saw a possum and then she, she recognised that that possum was related to a big skeleton, an ancient possum, which is called a diprotodon. She recognised that that possum was related to that skeleton and somebody else. So she, again, in, in 140 characters, she summed up something that she'd learnt at the museum and I just found that really interesting. Um, and then this last one, it's, it's fascinating how you can look at stuff and mammals have wings and bats have this and blah, 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 blah. So again, people are tweeting things. We often think of Twitter as a very um, silly thing, but I find that when people are, are, are really engaged in a museum physical visit, that they will tweet out something that's quite interesting. Um, the Tate also with their tanks projects, she actually, the person that did this study, she went and analysed a lot of tweets. And again, it was really interesting about... Um, talking about Twitter, how she found that you could actually measure effectiveness of marketing, which you can. She also analysed it as a channel for debate and conversations and she also um, used it to analyse visitors' understanding and experiences that they had at that particular site. So Twitter maybe is something that, again, trying to think about how to make audience research more relevant and used by people, maybe Twitter is something that we can look at. Um, another thing I've been thinking about over the past few years is this kind of idea about what kind of models do we need and in audience research what I see in my experience is that this social science model which is very much about let's have rigorous methodologies, we have to do long term studies, we have to do this and we have to do that, very much about museum to audience. Um, that's the approach that I think we've been using a lot and maybe that's what's turning people off because they're very big studies, they take a long time, the research results are very thick and um, people just don't have time to read them. So I'm wondering again, do we need different models? So some of the things I've been thinking about is the consultation model where you actually go and talk to your audiences, get a lot of feedback um, before that. And then the user generated model and building community. I'll just show you a few pictures. So for example, social science model up the top left hand side, very rigorous. Um, consultation model, this is me working with some indigenous people. Look at the computer, can you see that? <laughs> see that computer over there? My God, <laughs> I'm showing my age here. Again, working with Indigenous people, we were building some online um, materials for them, so got them all in and just really worked at it and developed it together. This um, exhibition here, All About Evil, we actually, instead of doing a front-end study, because the director at the time said, I, I need some research done, but I'm not giving you any money. So it's like, okay, what do we do? So we used a blog and we used Facebook to actually garner a whole community of people and we would just put out snippets of information. This is what we're thinking about in this exhibition and they'd all come back and say, oh, yeah, that sounds good or here's an image or I know somebody that does this. And that was a very um, very nice way of actually building um, a community and, and getting some feedback, which really cost us nothing. We, we just cost us our time. And the way me and the exhibition person worked is we programmed in some time every week to make sure that we went and did this stuff and did, did the blog and then we were doing Facebook the whole time. And then over in the right hand bottom here is some of the work that I've been doing with schools for 10 years and we have a um, what we call a kids college every year and we get a whole range of kids to come in from kindergarten which is year five, uh, age 5 in Australia up to year 12 which is about 18 and we give them a problem to solve and they come in and they talk to us, it might be an exhibition, it might be about um, we did one on climate change. We did one on digital technologies, we did one on text and how they want to read text. And again, that kind of thing was a very intensive 
two-day exercise, but we generated a lot of video and that's how we reported back. It was video and journals and things like that. And again, to show a project team or get them involved in that consultation was a great way to get the, the evaluation results, call it evaluation results, inputted into the program. So that's something, again, I've been thinking about. Now, this, this um, study here, has anybody apart from Sabine know about this particular piece of work. It's very interesting. It's on the Visitor Studies Group website, actually. And what these two authors did was they looked at all these summative evaluations across all these museums in, in England and how they actually impacted on practice. And they were saying, well, actually, that's not really done anything. <laughs> A lot of... Yeah, so we're going to talk about that next week, which is interesting. But again, um, I was kind of thinking about, well, OK, maybe is this something about how we're failing because are we just doing lots and lots of these studies and nothing's being implemented and again I do do have sympathy with them because I don't know if you've come across this John but I have had times when I've done you might have as well you've done all these great work and it just sits on someone's shelf and nothing ever gets done with it um yeah so okay so that's 20 minutes okay 30 okay all right, um, change, well, we know that slide will tire, you, tire us out. Um, thinking about organisational change and how, um, what we need in terms of new skills and how we're going to work with visitors, how we're going to put audience at the centre. And this, I quite like this quote at the bottom here. Um, and that's not me, that's, what's that name? He, I can't remember where he's from. But he's, they talk about how digital, they were talking about social media, but that how digital actually needs to put users at the centre of the equation. And for some people this is quite uncomfortable because a lot of curators, I've gone into a new museum that's kind of a bit old-fashioned as well, and the curators are kind of like, why do we need to talk to our audiences or find out what they're interested in? Because I'm interested in this topic and everybody needs to know about it. It's like, well, no, it's not actually how it works. Okay, so in this report, they come up with a whole range of ways that they think it could be done better. And I have to say that, yeah, ho-hum, I've talked about this for years now. Um, I don't see anything different or new here or exciting, I'm sorry. At least no one's tweeting this out, so <laughs> they won't know that I've been mean to them. Um, so it's like, okay, yeah, we could do all of that, but I would think probably in five years' time we'd still be standing here going, why isn't anybody listening to us? Um, because I've been in the tech world for about five years or so, I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from how they do their stuff. Um, if you look at this, this is how museums operate mostly. They tend to be conservative, authority-led, top-down communication, traditional approaches, long time frames. Whereas when we start looking at tech, it's like, well, technology is disruptive. It, it comes in and it changes people and you've got to adapt or not, or die, really. The consumer's authority, again, coming back to my shopping example, it's very much community-driven and shared. So um, somebody talked about that this morning. That's what the nature of tech is and developing technology. It's about the community. It's about, I'll, I'll build this piece of code and put it out there and the community can get back to us and we can build it together. Very much about agile approaches to working, which is very fast, rapid, iterate, prototype, 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 and then you might have a product at the end of it and, yeah, rapid response. So I'm thinking maybe we need to learn from that. This is, um, this is something from the Tech Republic that talks about, okay, how do we actually do user testing? And just by... And you had a... It's mostly about testing apps. And if by just... What's the word? Taking the word application out and turning it into program or exhibition. It's like, okay, well, this is probably some of the ways that we could be um, doing more. And as I said there, prototype, prototype, prototype is very important. And that's something I think science centres do very well. And I was at the Oakland Museum in San Francisco and they were taking me around and they did quite a lot of prototyping, which they ended up leaving in the exhibition because it had worked so well because they'd worked it up with visitors. So again, maybe what we're doing in audience research is trying to be too complicated when we can actually make everything more simple. Um, this, I wasn't going to show this, but I really, um, when John was speaking, I thought, well, maybe it's, w again, worth coming back to this approach, which was first done in 1993 and, and negotiating the competing needs that John talked about. It's about the competing needs of a museum to have a mandate to get a message out and an audience that has a mandate to actually, well, they want to, we, we want to actually get them to come in or use our product online or whatever. And that's where audience research can actually be the benchmark or the, the way that these things can happen. Uh, museums as learning organisations, well, I might just skip that one. Oh, yeah, this is, I love this one. 
I reckon if we had more of this, it would be so much easier to track visitors. <laughs> um, although I have to say, I did research on QR codes and near-field communication and whether people understood or how to, even knew how to use this on their phone. And back in March 2012, 64% of the people I spe spoke to didn't know what a QR code is. Then when I did it again in January, only, well, 32%, so less, like, half for the people. So they're becoming more ubiquitous. Um, whether you like them or not, they're kind of an interesting way to engage visitors. But as I said, this would be easy because we can just track everything we're doing. We don't even need to talk to anybody. So audience research might be good if we just had that. Um, this is not easy. I, I saw this at a bus stop in Toronto and I thought this really resonated with me, especially having children. It's like they stress about, well, will I go to university? What am I going to study? It's like it doesn't really matter because <laughs> you're going to work in five years' time in a job that nobody knows what it is yet. So it's like social media manager in a museum. Who would have thought of that like a couple of years ago that you have somebody with that um, position in the organisation? Um, future skills that we might need. Um, again, as audience researchers, I think we need to be thinking a bit more about being a storyteller and being a facilitator rather than just doing some research and putting it out there and saying, you know, listen to this, this is what they're saying. It's about working with um, the staff in the museums to make sure that they're involved and engaged. Um, we need to be e-publishers. I think we need to think about when we're doing our results is thinking about it in terms of a blog. I was always always a very strong believer in blogging and whenever we do an audience research study when I was at the Australian Museum and now it's like okay well how can I actually do it in 200 words and put it out to everybody so I think that that's an interesting thing we need to think about um, yeah I just wanted to mention this and I wanted to ask John about it because again this whole idea of what an iPad does it's like people are starting to scroll and swipe now so again I talk to the designers at work quite a lot about how people are going to navigate information now and in the future and what sort of research we need to do to find out if people are going to actually... Oh, how many times do you go up to a screen in a museum and you either scroll or you start touching it, it doesn't do anything? It's like this is just how we think about now. Anyway, um, I just wanted to come back to who we're actually here for. And this is the um, one of the images that I showed at the beginning. And this is from Declan, Declan 7. And Declan came to the museum during the summer holidays and he went on the... Vampire, which is a big destroyer ship that we ship vessel boat. I don't remember the difference. Um, and we've also got a submarine called the Onslow. And Declan was so inspired by this that when he went home, um, I'll just read out what he sent us. This gorgeous letter, you know, it's seven year old with all the way he wrote it. But he said, "My favourite toy is Lego." And on Wednesday, I and my friends went to the Maritime Museum, and the Vampire gave me an idea to build one myself out of Lego. Plus, we had so much fun. And then he sent us all these pictures. And I just wanted to finish off with this because I think that sometimes we forget who we're here for, and we're here for the audience. And Sometimes you can't measure what they're going to do. Who would have known that this kid, age seven, would go home and spend... He's obviously spent a lot of time because it's quite complicated. And to me, that's kind of visitor audience research gold because it's something that somebody has gone and done and been challenged and inspired by a visit to a museum. So, again, just to finish off with Declan and, again, remembering that this is what we're about. So, thanks. <laughs>